following is a special presentation of ABC Sports. Tennis, like a bright sun, has followed a high arc off the horizon to reach the apex of the sports world. But the dawn of the women's game wasn't pushed by nature's force. It rose because of Billie Jean King. I had been chosen as, as the voice, so if I don't win, they're still not going to listen to this voice. So that was a, a kind of a double pressure. The game shines because of players like Tanda Rubin, who invited into their lives. There's only a, a certain number of people that are going to be number one, and uh, hopefully that'll be me. But if not, I still want to be able to look back and say, I'm happy with uh, you know, what I did. And champions who persevere despite dark moments show us that the game will endure. I think 95 showed it that the passion is there. There's so many moments and, and uh, so many things that I still enjoy so much around the tennis that um, that mo motivation is still extremely big. Nike presents a passion to play. The rules of tennis haven't changed much since women picked up their first rackets a century ago. But off the court, perhaps no women's sport has evolved more. Hello everyone, I'm Robin Roberts. Today, tennis may be the only pro sport in which the popularity of the women's game rivals that of the men's. It's also so lucrative that the only females to rank among the world's 40 highest paid athletes have been tennis players. But there was a time when all this seemed unimaginable. In the early 1900s, there were only a few sports considered proper for women to play. By the 60s, that had changed, but still athletics were little more than glorified hobbies, amusements, and certainly no place to consider making a living. Then came a bespectacled brunette from Long Beach, California, who decided to take a stand. Her name was Billie Jean King, and her platform was tennis. Her talent made her a champion on the court, but her tenacity and conviction to fairness made her a champion of something larger gender equality. In the 70s, when she was at her most controversial and colorful, people didn't know whether she was a villain, a dreamer, or a saint. But one thing was certain. She knew what she wanted, and she was unstoppable. Ever since that day when I was 11 years old, and I wasn't allowed in a photo because I wasn't wearing a tennis skirt, I knew then that I wanted to change the sport. Billie Jean King, after Jackie Robinson, is the single most important sports cultural figure that this nation has ever thrown up. Here comes Billy Jean King. In a lot of ways, I think Billy Jean King invented professional women's sports. Yes, yes. She was mother freedom. She was the earth mother of that tennis troupe. Billy Jean was born in 1943, the first of two children for Bill and Betty Moffitt. Her father was a fireman, and along with her mother, encouraged athletics. I grew up in team sports. My younger brother, Randy Moffat, ended up being a, a very successful relief pitcher in most of those years with the San Francisco Giants. And I did ask my mom and dad, I said, you know, I, I would love to have a career in sports, because that's really where my skills are. That's when my dad and my mom said, well, maybe tennis. I didn't have a racket, so I had to go do little odd jobs around the neighborhood, and I put my money in a mason jar up in the cupboard, and I kept counting, and finally got about the $8.29. I said, I can't stand any longer. I've got to get this racket. So we went to a local sporting goods store, and I got my first racket, and then went to my first lesson with Clyde Walker. And I knew that first lesson, the first time I hit the ball at first lesson, this, I found my destiny. Eager to develop her own style, she was always compared to the woman who ultimately changed her game, Wimbledon champion Alice Marble. I eventually got to read The Road to Wimbledon, which was Alice Marble's autobiography. And I was very fortunate to be able to get lessons from her for three months every weekend in Encino, California. And she really made a difference. I went from 19th in the country, uh, this was when I was 15 years old, to number four in the country in women's tennis. And she's the reason. When did you realize that you could make a career out of, of playing. I mean, we're talking in the 60s. This wasn't about making money. Well, they called it amateur tennis. We called it shamateur tennis among us because it was a, a sham and, and a shame at the same time in that uh, we were getting paid under the table. Uh, the same officials who created the rules for us had total control over us. They made the rules, 
And then they were also the people who actually broke the rules because they owned the tournaments and then they'd pace under the table to come and play. It was a terrible life. I didn't like it. And I started speaking out against it. Did you get support from other players? The men squeezed us out. The player, male players particularly, would tell the promoters of tournaments, who were always men, who, who owned or promoted these tournaments, don't have the women anymore. Particularly when prize money came into being, they would say, the women don't draw anyway, we want all the money. And the players pushed me to be their leader. Followers choose leaders. Leaders don't choose followers. The players chose me and pushed me and conjoled me into being the spokesperson. We didn't want to be second-class citizens anymore. The women decided to band together, and with Billie Jean leading the way, they organized an all-female tennis circuit. Well, oh, we wouldn't have had a tour without Gladys Heldman, who at that time was publisher of, of World Tennis Magazine. And Rosie Casals and I went to Gladys and said, help us. And she said, OK. So she went to Philip Morris. The idea turned out to be fashionable. By 1973, the tobacco company had already tapped the female market. This is the Slim cigarette made just for women, New Virginia Slims. The tour had its leader, its sponsor, and its name. But who would play? And then you had nine of us who had the courage or stupidity. We didn't know it, <laughs> which one at the time, but we, we knew what we wanted for our sport. And we said, okay, we're going to do it. No matter what happens, we're going to sign a $1 contract with Gladys Helman. But that was the birth of women's professional tennis the way we know it today. You were very vocal. You were trying to get people to watch tennis, to be passionate about your sport. Then you had to go and perform. And if you didn't win, the gig was up. <laughs> no, you have to win. You have to be number one. People don't listen to you unless you're number one. There's no question. Throughout her crusade, Billie Jean King remained a consistent and constant champion. In a career that spanned more than two decades, she won a dozen Grand Slam singles titles, a record 20 different Wimbledon titles, mostly in doubles, and 67 WTA tournaments. Tonight Coming up, sin. Billie Jean Not King and Bobby Riggs, the match that made no history. Variety, but in this panoramic scene, a happening. So and later, a rare interview with Steffi Groff. Of, um... of passion to play. This ABC Sports exclusive brought to you by Nike, who encourages you to participate in the lives of America's youth. Avion Natural Spring Water, the official sponsor of the 1996 Women's Volleyball Pro Beach Tour. State Farm Insurance, like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. And Tagamet HB, advanced prevention of heartburn. If you let me play. If you let me play sports. I will like myself more. I'll have more self-confidence. If you let me play sports. If you let me play. If you, if let, you let me, me play. I'll be 60% less likely to get breast cancer. I will suffer less depression. If you let me play sports. I will be more likely to leave a man who beats me. If you let me play. I'll be less likely to get pregnant before I want to. I will learn. I will learn what it means to be strong. To be strong. If you let me play. Play sports. If you let me play sports. Teachers inspire dreams, shape lives, and give us hope for the future. Yet too often, their contributions go unnoticed. There are over two million teachers in America, but not even the best get the recognition they deserve. That's why State Farm started the Good Neighbor Award for teachers. To tell them, we appreciate what you're doing for our children. As America stepped into the 70s, creating change was a mission of the masses, and women were no strangers to the theme. Inevitably